process is really all paper and wood, uh, beeswax and damar. So it's, uh, I'm, they're all drawings, they're not paintings. I mean, there's a lot of painting in these, but uh, the bulk of it is basically drawings. And, uh, and then they are cut out and collaged onto panels that have been, uh, different kinds of surfaces have been put on the, uh, the surf, on the, it's always, it's always paper. And then sometimes it's splattered with paint or ink. It's, uh, bleach does amazing stuff. So I, I kind of just experiment with these surfaces. And that's the beauty of that process, I think, because I don't always have any concept of what the piece is going to be. But uh, when I start, I just start with making the ground. And the ground kind of oftentimes guides what the piece is going to become. The beauty of that is that it allows for another level of uh, creative intervention. Because um, I'm, then I got, I got a bunch of little drawings that I can then assemble in different ways and, and see what goes with what. And the meaning can completely change. You know, it's, I like the idea that there's the unpredictability of what the piece will be because I can start throwing things even randomly down and it will turn into something that I hadn't foreseen at all. Strategy of making images, because that's what artists do. Uh, for me, uh, they're narrative, they're narrative images for sure, but, uh, it, and I think it used to be that I would come up with an idea that I would then go make the piece about the idea, much less so now. I think that's almost maybe what was happening in graduate school a long time ago or something, but it's, it's not... I don't think it's relevant for a mature artists to work that way. It's contrived. It seems contrived. And it, what it does mostly is it destroys the mystery for the, not only the viewer, but for me. So if there's ambiguity in it, um, David Hockney used this wonderful term. He called it correct. Is it correct? And he's talking about visually. Is it visually correct? Well, that's the standard that I strive for now. Uh, but I don't let the narrative part uh, drive everything. I let the, the visual correctness of it. If, it. if it's right, that's what I'm going for. A lot of people can read paintings really easily and very well. I mean, they have that, that cultural education. Other people have none of it. They just don't. And uh, so uh, I think that somebody that spends any time with one of these images would pretty easily come up with uh, or get pretty darn close to what it was I was thinking about. Um, but I, again, I don't want to make illustrations for a magazine. I, you know, I want to keep it ambiguous and uh, to some degree. I mean, most people would look at my work and say that I relinquish control never because it's pretty tight. I mean, it's pretty, you know, the process is the thing that uh, the, the drawing elements, the components are, are tightly rendered, I think, because that's what I like. I mean, there's a ton of draftsmanship in it. That's what I like. So I'm, I'm not going to stop doing that. It's the process that I've concocted that allows me to uh, loosen things up somewhat uh, by adding different elements, you know, the grounds and the splattering paint and, you know, using matchbooks for her shirt or you know cutting a hole in the panel and putting a toy parachute man that I had as a kid inside a window so it becomes a reliquary or something you know if you have uh, that process is broad enough like I say if it's broad enough you won't become too precious I don't think uh, but then too there's that guiding thing about visually correct. Is it visually correct? Does it look good? And the, the problem with that is, of course, that the notion of visual correctness seems to change as I age. So I look at pieces that I made in, you know, 2015, and I think, oh, God, you know, I got to get rid of this. <laughs> you know, I got to get rid of it somehow. Give it away or grind it down or whatever. So. I mean, they were satisfying visually at the times they're made, but yeah, it seems to change over time. Mm -hmm. 
No, I, I build panels. And I got a little lovely wood shop here. And I uh, cut up uh, four by eight pieces of, uh, of good ply and I put together panels on uh, quarter inch plywood. And uh, they're, they're cradled, they're called uh, cradled panels. They're used in encaustic painting a lot, uh, but they're just straightforward uh, cradled, cradled panels and they're not very deep. They look like this. They're very durable. So, yeah, um, and a lot of the pieces I've cut through and put things inside, so it gives you a lot of options to play with. I have started making frames now. Um, for the smaller pieces, mostly, I mean, the, the biggest one I've framed right now is two by two or so. And they're carved frames. Not all of them are carved, but uh, I love that too. It's like the perfect process for me because I, I have drawing, I have painting, I have woodworking, and it, it starts with woodworking, it ends with woodworking. I have a bunch of ink, paint, uh, pencils, and everything in between. So it's a nice, it's a nice way of working, I think, for me. I mean, it. there's the uh, idea that. Uh, Ambiguity, inscrutability. I, I started thinking that religion and art have something in common insofar as they gain power through inscrutability. Like if you don't completely understand the thing, if there's, an, if there's no mystery in religion, it seems to be impoverished in a way. And if you understand everything about religion, you have a legal contract with God or something, you know? And with art, it seems similar to me, the creator, if I don't fully understand everything about the, the pieces that I'm making, I will continue to come back over and over and be interested. If I make a piece that I know everything about, it seems uh, dead pretty quick. It's not a gateway piece. Those gateway pieces are the ones that make me uh, wonder where it's going. It needs more exploration. A gateway piece is a, is a piece where you do something and you realize that it's going to um, be responsible for creating like 10 or 20 more pieces because it's, it's got enough meat in it, it's broad enough, it's deep enough that it's going to allow you to uh, explore it for a while. Um, and it could be any number of different series that I've done uh, but, you know, if it becomes a series, it's a gateway piece. I mean, so I made a bunch of these bilaterally symmetrical pieces. Um, and, and I liked them because, again, it was one of those drawings that we, you're not entirely sure what they're going to look like. Sometimes they really look great. Sometimes they look horrible. But, uh, you know, you just take a page and divide it in half. And you draw your image on this side. And then you put a piece of tracing paper on the line, tape it down, trace over, flip it, trace it over your lines, and it copies your lines exactly. Of course, all that's done on the computer now. I know, people can do that on the computer very easily. But for these pieces, you know, on paper, that's how I did it. And, uh, yeah, I loved them. I loved them. It was, uh, that was a gateway kind of trip, because I made a bunch of them. <laughs> You draw the face, and then you draw the face, and then you shade it. So, and I've done more than two faces. I've done all kinds of different things, and uh, it gets really complex. Um, some of them do. Um, one of my favorite pieces in the house, and I think it's it's like the uh, it's cool when you have uh, the quintessential piece from a series. And you go, you can actually say, that's the one, that's the one. Text is a big thing that changes uh, the meaning of a piece, I find. Because, I mean, when people go to a museum and they, they look at uh, an Anselm Kiefer painting that's the size of a wall, and they, the first thing they do is they walk over to the, the little label on the wall to see what the title is, right? 
at Lilith, ash flower, whatever it is, and uh, and then it the the conversation begins to fire. I think in their heads, but I just put text on the pieces oftentimes, and uh, and I find that that is so powerful it'll completely change the meaning. So so yeah, the 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 painting kind of guides me, and I guide the painting. It's, a, it's something of a trade-off. Living the life I live, it, it's it's good. It's such a good life because um, I'm steeped in it all day long. I'm talking to kids about art. I'm making art with them. On the weekends, I'm building frames or whatever I'm doing, building panels. So um, it's all a continuum. You know, I where did I get this idea? I don't know. You know, it's all. What you do with, I think, to, to live a wonderful life is, is create the scenario for it to happen and then it starts to all happen and you don't, you don't really have to search. You're not constantly searching for inspiration or something. If you're living the right life, it seems like it's given to you. And then the content stuff is ongoing and changing always and it's always... I mean, I've never been the kind of artist that is a, um, a single kind of concept artist. I mean, I always thought of those irascible artists or a lot of modern artists that are, their paintings are like, I'm the guy that makes the vertical lines or I'm the guy that makes the horizontal lines. What a dreadful prison to be in, you know, where you, you're making a ton of money. That's the, that's the good part, but you're going to have to do that for the rest of your life. And that seems horrible to me. So... This is the antidote to that. This is like, well, if I get tired of of uh, doing watercolors, I'll just switch over and make prints for a while. And if that isn't working, then I'll make drawings for a while, and then I'll switch to paintings. So it's it's all represented, and uh, yeah, it's a good process. I like it.